Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Manier. I work at Intel Labs, and today I'm going to be presenting with Jen Pukem. Um, he works in VMware, and we're talking about computational storage, uh, specifically the opportunities for virtualized environments. This is in collaboration with MinIO. So I'm going to start off with Intel's view, Intel Labs' view on computational storage, because this really started as a research project, and we're still doing a significant amount of pathfinding to figure out what the entire solution stack needs to look like. And then I'll turn it over to JK, and he'll talk about the implications and opportunities in, in a VM environment. So this is what our research looks like at the 10,000 foot view. Um, at the bottom of the stack, you see block storage. Um, this could be an individual device, but in the case of our research, we're looking at storage servers, uh, NVMe over TCP or NVMe over fabrics in general, even iSCSI. Um, within the storage server, you have CPUs and accelerators. Uh, certainly you'll have powerful Xeons down there uh, and companion processors like DSA. Um, smart NICs, uh, IPUs, uh, GPUs and FPGAs, and of course, SSDs. We're looking at NAND SSDs and Optane SSDs, and both of these could have computational capabilities within the SSD itself. So you can see here from an Intel's perspective, um, there's a pretty big silicon inventory that you could use to build a computational storage device. And the big question for us is, what's the right bill of materials? You know, how do you put all this together? Uh, we obviously want to improve performance, reduce cost and all of that, but what's the right recipe? And I think that's what most of the industry is really interested in at this point. So to do this, we built a, a prototype stack to evaluate a number of different what-if scenarios. Um, and software is a significant component of the stack. Without the enabling software, it's really difficult to program the silicon directly. Um, so we start off with a secure multi-tenant programming layer that's gonna reside in the storage system. So chances are you're not gonna have access to a dedicated storage system. You're gonna be one of many tenants. Uh, you might have other tenants that are sharing the computational resources with you. So we need to figure out the right way to do this. Whether you're doing simple calculations like CRC, a search operation, or something more complex like AI and ML uh, deep learning pipelines, what's the right way to share that? If we now go outside of the block storage server and we look at the application server, there are a number of different enabling layers. So if we start at the very bottom of the stack, as best as we can, we want to work with legacy block storage. In many cases, it would be much easier to change that interface to be object or key value because then you've got something really convenient to associate computation with. Um, but most of the storage today is attached through block. You know, if you go to the actual media and we see that not changing anytime in the near future. So if we're talking NVMe or a Fabrics version of that or SCSI or a Fabrics version of that one or even VertIO or vSAN, these are all block protocols. And so how can you get computational storage through the block protocol, right? And we're thinking we've got some, some easy ways to do that. And this is actually what the NVMe standards group is looking at as well, you know, extending the block protocol for computation. Assuming we, we solve that problem, uh, the aggregation layer is gonna be really important because chances are your data is not gonna live on one device. You've got availability considerations. So whether it's erasure coding, RAID, or even simple replication, we need to figure out how to assign compute to different shards of data. Right now, Hadoop has been doing that kind of work for years. Hadoop is basically computational storage. But if we go down to the block layer, we need to have a lot of that work there as well. So if you're looking for uh, searching a string and you only see half of the file, how do you decompose a search to process just that one half of the file, right? So that's why itself is an interesting research problem. And we're thinking it needs to be solved in convenient libraries that users can use. Um, we then go to a scheduling layer. So if you've got all the silicon in the bottom, um, how do you schedule on top of that? It, it turns out to be an interesting scheduling exercise. Uh, the operating system today, they have very capable schedulers. We need to teach them about remote accelerators so that they can take a, a task and then decompose it in a way that, that is optimal. Now that doesn't mean that we offload everything. You'll have capable processors in the application server as well. So it turns into a distributed computing exercise. So we want to figure out based on the silicon and the storage system and the silicon and the compute server, how do you decompose the work to make things most efficient, right? So that's a really important scheduling layer. Um, finally, unless we want application developers to code to this directly, we want to give them very convenient APIs, something like Intel's one API, where they see that different silicon is available. They give us some portable code, perhaps written in data parallel C++, that we then decompose onto these different storage engines. Our belief is without that, computational storage is really gonna be relegated to niche industries, right? And so we really need to open up the interface to make it so the average application developer can program this. So th this is basically, it sets the research vectors uh, for Intel Labs. 
Now, if we have to just focus on one use case, and this is actually what got us started with computational storage, just look at data scrubbing. So it's a practical microservices use case. Whether you're MinIO, you're Ceph, OpenStack, or Cassandra, you need to protect the integrity of your data for availability purposes. So what these object storage, storage servers do is they regularly read out all of the data from the, the file systems, and they check some previously calculated hashes to make sure that there wasn't any bit rot. And if there was bit rot, they reconstruct from replicas or erasure codes, right? So it could be CRC 32C, MD5, in the case of MinIO, it's highway hash, but the basic process is the same across these uh, different storage uh, stacks. So if you look on the left there, you can see the MinIO storage stack with a well-known S3 API, right? But it sits on top of a, con a conventional Linux file system like XFS. This is where the file system uh, can potentially corrupt data. There are bugs in the operating system all the time, right? And there are bugs in the, own, the software that you're writing. So you need to protect yourself against that software and then anything that happens in transit, right? So you apply hashes at this layer. Right. In block storage, that's where we want to check the hashes. Right. So, but to do this, it's a basic computational storage problem. We want to do a hash of a file, but block storage doesn't even know what a file is. Right. And so, if we look at this as representative of what most computational storage problems look like, and we can solve this problem, then we can set much larger goals of doing something not as simple as scrubbing, but maybe image cropping in a deep learning pipeline. So this is how we got started, but we think there's actually a progression from something simple like this to something more complex. So the research platform that we created, we wanted to operate on objects because objects are very, uh, very convenient way to do computation. So whether the object is a file, a directory, a table or a record, you wanna be able to teach block storage that that's the unit of computation. So you wanna be compressing a record or searching for something in a table or uh, searching a file, for example. And so the key is getting this object construct down to the storage system. Once we have that object construct, we can search the text, ob text object A, we can classify image object B. So really anything that you can do from the application server's perspective that's against objects, you can now do in the storage system. And the scheduling exercise comes into play here. So we wanna execute on diverse hardware. Once we have this object and we know the computation to be done, that's where the operating system scheduler can take over. And something like one API can help us distribute the work uh, appropriately. So if you look on the right here, this is a simplified version of what we're dealing with here. Uh, the application server has a file system. It has all the metadata to tell you where that file lives in block storage. And so we can ask the file system to give us the block allocation information, right? With that block allocation information and a file size, we can now specify an operation. For example, we wanna search this object that has a size 1023 bytes, we wanna search for the string hello. And then now in block storage, you can actually create what we're calling a virtual object, which is it's just an ephemeral mapping that lets you see that object long enough to do the computation, send the result back to the initiator, and then you can delete the mapping, right? So we published this a few years back in hot storage, we call it the virtual object approach. And this is a research uh, prototype that allows us to use legacy block storage with minimal modification. Under the hood, we use FIE map, map to get the block mappings from the file system. We package it up in a vendor specific NVMe command, and then we send it over the wire. Now from the application's perspective, they just have to uh, launch one of our, our pre-compiled executables. They specify the operation that they wanna do, uh, the file that that operation is gonna be applied to, and then a device. So this is the one interesting thing here. You can see that it's computational storage because we're sending all of this to an NVMe device. Again, could be a single device, could be an entire array. Now let's give, me a, give you a sense for what the performance benefit might look like, uh, specifically in the context of a storage array. So we've got a single compute server uh, attached to a single storage server. This happens to be an Ice Lake server packed with uh, eight NAND SSDs. And we've got eight file systems mounted, which is kind of characteristic of what the object storage stacks do, one file system per SSD. So we wanted to test some different primitives here, like uh, scrubbing the data with CRC 32C, 32C, doing deduplication, searching the data, or doing intrusion detection. And we're comparing conventional uh, storage to computational storage. And what you can see on the right here is in the conventional case, whether we're at 10, 40, or 100 gig connectivity, we very quickly reach the network bottleneck, right? And this is really the motivation behind computational storage, to get rid of the IO bottleneck. But as soon as we turn on computational storage, we go from a network bottleneck immediately to an SSD or a CPU bottleneck. And this is actually a good place for us to be in because it's, more, it, it's much easier for us to change these than to change the network infrastructure. And so also I'd like to point out that whether we're on a 1040 or 100 gig link, 
the performance of computational storage is all the same because we're not we're only using that link to send small little control messages that exact command that I mentioned. So that's just to give you a sense of what uh, performance to expect when you've got an IO bottleneck. And with this, let me go ahead and turn it over to JK, and he's going to walk us through some of the implications with virtual machines. Take it away. Thanks, Mike. Uh, as Mike mentioned, the Intel has uh, the rich set of the Intel, the process uh, accelerator, and also FPGA and GPU, IPU. So there was a lot of computational resources we have in the server and also uh, Smartonic side and then also storage side. The BMA are actually looking at the fully utilized these resources uh, for uh, our the lot of application. Can you go to the next slide? So we look at the where the computational storage device uh get the benefit most and then one of the example we uh studied with the university of Bayern research team was the text uh, log analytic is a very hard problem uh, so uh, the sheer size of the data uh, actually located in the storages and then pulling the data through the networking is very expensive and slow and then if you move the, those analytic uh, function near storages, we see the significant performance improvement, uh, order of magnitude, uh, quality performances uh, compared to the software only like a Splunk implementation. And then uh, we saw the also uh, much lower power consumption. So it is uh, clear uh, to see that the computational storage device good at the near storages uh, accelerated the function. Can you go to the next slide? So the other example uh, we look at uh, with the more uh, general databases like the Green Plum MPP databases, uh, actually running the multiple instance of PostgreDB uh, to run the, the query and some uh, analytic function in parallel uh, with the very large number of devices. So in this case, also we saw that the, if we upload the sum of query uh, near storages, uh, and then uh, we see the very good uh, scale uh, of the performances. So uh, these two cases confirm that uh, our uh, BMR customer can uh, benefit from the computational storages, uh, but the question is the how easily uh, our customer can use the, these devices and how effectively uh, used. So that's where the, we see the opportunity to virtualize the computational uh, storage device as uh, some virtual instances. Uh, but the, another uh, the positive uh, direction we observed recently the SNIA computational storage task group and MVME uh, computational storage uh, work group is working on the, the additional the command set uh, for computational storage device on top of MVME uh, controller spec. Can you go to the next slide? So there we see the opportunity uh, to extend our existing virtual MVME implementation uh, or hardware emulated on the Smartening uh, to add the CSD command set support uh, in the future when those spec is released. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we collaborate with the Intel uh, to uh, demonstrate some benefit uh, with the, uh, the prototype we have. And the, the with this hardware, uh, the virtual live with the virtual instances. And then uh, it actually, we can use the hardware accelerator more effectively. And then uh, we can uh, share the, with the multiple instance of the VM and uh, Kubernetes instances. And the, I believe that this uh, virtualization uh, allow the much flexible composition of the storage and the computational resources like the FPGA, Smart Core, and Accelerator in the processor. 
So uh, we can uh, offload the fixed function like the compression and encryption uh, or the more sophisticated the computational service like the key value engine and database query and so on. So uh, this is a big opportunity uh, to uh, take advantage uh, with the, this uh, virtualization of the CSD in the future. Can you go to the next slide? So the way uh, we actually uh, put the, this computational storage as a virtual instances uh, as shown in this diagram. So currently the VM directly talk to uh, the MVME device through the PCI pass through. Uh, so that's the given. And then uh, if we have a virtual CSD emulation, and then we uh, go through the our virtualization layer, and then uh, we uh, talk with the virtual object, which is a virtual disk, and then uh, in that way uh, we actually uh, apply the computational resources in the much more granular way, and uh, those granular could be MVME namespaces uh, from the devices or. Uh, it could be the virtual disk from the, our uh, cluster file system uh, called the VMFSs, or our software-defined storage uh, like the vSAN uh, can offer the granular of the virtual disk accesses. And then we have uh, the project called the Project Monterey, uh, the running the, our uh, the VM kernel on the Smartnic, and then we the compose the storage uh, device like the MVME devices as a physical MVME, and then we can uh, run uh, the computational service in the Smartnic, uh, which has the number of uh, ARM core and maybe GPU and FPGA and or accelerator function. So this is a good target. Uh, we actually are running the computational function. And then CSD device uh, from the multiple uh, smart SSD or computational storage device vendor, uh, we can just uh, use those function directly from the VM or through the our virtualization uh, as shown in this diagram. Can you go next slide? So uh, the, this uh, computational storage can be uh, used in the cloud setting, uh, as I show in the, this diagram. Uh, in the cloud scale, uh, we have a number of compute nodes, uh, which are running the big data analytic and AI ML and so on. And then it has a number of storage nodes uh, to offer the storage service uh, in the scalable way. And then it has a, the sense storages and it also has the object storage like the Amazon S3 uh, like. And uh, the biggest, uh, the trend in this cloud uh, application, they just are running the number of instances instances at scale. Uh, so big data analytic and databases and AI ML actually just scale a uh, thousand of nodes uh, and then they just run in parallel, uh, have a huge scalability. And then storage node also scale uh, in the very large scale. So example is the Amazon AWS Redshift running on the compute node and then AWS Aqua running on the storage node and the AWS S3 serve as a storages. And then uh, the, in this kind of uh, cloud architecture, CSD can be fit into storage node to upload some computational function, compression, encryption, like the fixed function. And then uh, also the CSD device used in the object store too. So the, the collaboration with the main IO, particularly uh, we try to demonstrate how a CSD uh, can be integrated with the object store uh, to minimize the, the data move uh, cost of a storage network. 
and then uh, we offer the much better the scalability and uh, less CPU usages. Can you go to the next slide? So this is the architecture uh, that we assume uh, that the running with the MinIO. So MinIO object is stored in the middle and then uh, top layer, there was a number of uh, the application, uh, machine running and big data analytics and bag of disaster recovery instances are running there. And then uh, it pushed down, check some compression, such type of uh, operation through the API. Uh, and then the mean IO instances running as a state list uh, instances. And then they just run the object storage uh, API related to function. And then uh, it has one more disaggregation between the mean IO software and storage target. So the storage uh, can be run with the mean IO in the particular instances. But in this diagram, the storage is uh, running as a separate target. And then the mean IO uh, instances running with the CSD. Uh, initiator, and then they just scale independently. And then in that way, they can scale uh, much better. And then CSD target uh, actually running the more the storage related function. So uh, we minimize the data move uh, near storages. So the biggest benefit of the, this architecture uh, is the granular accesses. So the application actually know best of the, whether they really need the compression or not. Uh, for example, uh, the big data, uh, data format like the park heat, uh, it has uh, some compressed format. So if application know uh, this, the object already compressed in the application level, and then underlining level doesn't really need a compression. Also, it actually has uh, some, uh, the data scrubbing uh, requirement actually specify the, the upper application level with the such granular, uh, we can do much better job uh, in the underlining layer. So that kind of uh, granular uh, control of the data are related to computation operation actually give us much better efficiency and to minimize the data move and that we can optimize in our platform. Uh, that's what uh, we are looking for as opportunity uh, with this architecture. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Great, thank you, JK. So that brings us to the end of our talk. Um, quick summary, but this is also a look at it as a call to action. We're collaborating to build a complete end-to-end -end solution prototype. Look at it almost as a product concept. Computational storage is a pretty big space. And not everyone is looking at the complete stack end-to-end, -end, especially in virtualized environments. So we see an opportunity here uh, to work with the rest of the industry. So we're starting simply and then moving out in, in terms of complexity. The data scrubbing plugin, uh, MinAI was actually built this for us. We can take their streaming highway hash implementation, optimize with ABX 512, and then plug that into our backend storage system. Now, all of this is going to be plumbed through VMware's uh, container environment, Tanzu. Um, so what we want to do here is take the stack and really explore it top to bottom to see where the opportunities are. And anything that can be used to influence and inform the standard, we're looking at that as well. And again, data scrubbing is just a first step. And, but from this, we hope to flash out most of the host side software implications, you know, things like erasure coding and RAID and replication are some of the examples that I mentioned. Um, and then with that, move on to more complex offloads. So with that, we'd like to conclude our talk. And if you're interested in potentially collaborating with us, uh, please reach out to me or JK. And thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.